Good evening, good evening. We're here today with some of the greatest brain trust when it comes to the ABCs of supplementation and nutrition. And I have the pleasure today to have inside the track and field oval, Kevin Young, world record holder, Olympic champion, Al Claiborne, trainer to the stars, Johnny Gamble, great cyclist. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? Doing great. Good. All right, man, you, you guys don't sound excited. I mean, we have an opportunity <laughs> here to uh, get the, the word out on supplementation and nutrition, and that's been the tricky subject lately. Obviously, with four Jamaican athletes testing positive, with our own Tyson Gay testing positive, and um, it's just the black eye on track and field. And I wanted to bring you gentlemen along because you guys are the experts. And from what I've been told later on, we've got Dr. Oliver Catlin joining us, who is the A-plus student when it comes down to the ABCs of nutrition and supplementation. So uh, what we're going to start off with is... Everybody knows Kevin Young, world record holder and uh, Olympic champion, great Olympic champion. But I uh, wanted to start, you know, first, uh, Johnny, just kind of give us a background and how you got in the sport, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, well, my background is in, I obviously built my career in cycling, the majority of it. I've uh, started racing bicycles at five, so I've been in the sport for my whole entire life. Um Chasing the dream in my 20s, didn't quite make it there, became a coach and studied, uh, went to college after that at the age of 28 and uh, studied biochemistry physiology, uh, worked in the exercise science lab and did a lot of sucking up as much knowledge as I possibly could, um, started surrounding myself with more professional level athletes and coaches throughout my career and worked my way to the Tour de France um, with the Garmin team. And uh, basically I study and have been doing formulations on dietary supplements to include everything from sports drinks, recovery drinks before, um, to dietary supplements as much as amino acids, herbs, and different things like that. Great. Al? How about you? How did you get into sports? How did we get here? How did we get the privilege of having your knowledge base with us today? <laughs> okay. Well, my background is uh, is bodybuilding. I mean, I started I started competing at 15, and I'm 50 now, so it's been some years. Uh, I don't compete anymore, but I'm I'm now in in the area of teaching fitness. Um, started. Started training way back when high school, and following nutrition, ever since. Because you know that nutrition is at the forefront of of any kind of development you're going to get out of your body. So, um, went to chef school, got out of chef school, went in military, became an athletic PO, started working with uh, uh, special forces, um, came out, um, started a business in Los Angeles, and picked up a few celebrities and that took off and uh I've been pretty much on the road ever since. Um, authored a cookbook and uh came to Georgia, opened up a gym. And I have a few of them and I'm working on uh, doing doing more of a uh, more product development around physical fitness. So just being an advocate man, helping people lose weight and get in shape. Well, we know it's a little bit more than just uh, getting in shape and and um, taking a few pills. I I know that you know in our discussion before we came on the air, we were talking about how many people have gone to lightning in a bottle and thinking that hey, you can control your diet through a pill, not do any working out, and you're going to drop a lot of weight. And we know that. Um, that's kind of be a short-lived run, and then ultimately you're tearing up your body. So uh, I want to first start about, you know, the challenges of nutrition and navigating. The first thing is a grocery store. And, Al, from your perspective, I'm an athlete. I'm walking in. 
you know, I can read labels just like anybody else. It tells you RDA, right. it tells you percentages, but for an athlete who's starting their training program, what is it or where do, what part of the grocery store do I want to go to? Well, you want to stay on the aisles. I mean, you know, you want to stay in the produce section, stay on the aisle, stay out of the aisles, stay on the perimeter of the store. That's, that's not, that's more than just a cliche. It's, it's just how stores are set up. If you, if you stay on a perimeter, you're going to run into your healthier choices. You run into your meat department. You're going to run into your produce department. And, and all the in between is the stuff that they want you to walk down, walk, walk through because it's really the cheapest food to produce and it's got the highest markup on it. But at the same time, it's stripped of a lot of, a lot of good nutrients and, uh, it's highly processed and we always give advice in dietetics is to keep our clients on the perimeter. And that's where you get in your milk, your eggs, you get in your, your cheeses, you get in your, you know, your, uh, your, um, your, your muscle building foods and your vegetables, your fruit. That's where you'd find that stuff. But just as a rule of thumb, if you want to, you know, keep it real, stay on, stay on the, uh, stay on the perimeter of the store. So on the walls, out of the halls. Yep, absolutely. Great. Now, why would I want to go down there? I mean, I hear you saying it. You know, we know that the vegetables, the the dairy, the meats are out on the walls. But what is it specifically about the proteins? Where am I finding my proteins? I'm. A, let's say I'm a young athlete, a growing body. Let's start with those young folks first. I'm a growing body. Okay. I, I hear you. Well. You- the foods that are going to give you the, the best bang for the buck are going to be your, your foods that have um, the best. Uh, this word is kind of tricky, but there's only kind of there's only one way I can kind of get around it, which is anabolic foods, which is your dense protein foods, your red meats, and uh, your 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 fish, your fatty fish. Um, they tend to have the highest of your amino acids, which are your building blocks, your eggs, your cheese, you know, your milk. Um, that that said, you know, it's it's difficult to kind of say that to a vegetarian because it makes them cringe. But there are things that are on the perimeter store for vegetarians too. Of course, you know, you got a lot of good vegetables. You got a good, you got nuts and seeds. You got other protein sources that you can use to build your body, and um, I mean it's that's well all I can really recommend when it comes to thinking about what's in the perimeter of the store. I mean, there's a lot of choices. I can talk about this all day, but that's the that's the short of it. Now, Johnny, for the, the at the biochem level, okay. So Al is saying you go in and you get proteins. Uh, omega fish oils, things of that nature. Um, how does that body process those proteins to turn it into muscle that we can turn into uh, performance? Okay, so the protein, regardless of where you get your protein from, um, the sources are definitely something you've got to be very picky and choosy on because the proteins that you're going to get in red meat, salmon, good fishes, stuff like that, are going to be a little bit higher in IGF-1s and 2s, insulin-like growth factors. Um, Those things metabolize in the body, formed by the liver. Um, Growth hormone after training is really high. All those things create an anabolic process, meaning to grow. Um, And basically, all that boils down to is uptake of protein, to rebuild muscle tissue, central nervous system, all the things that are kind of out of whack and beat up in your body after a training session. So those are the main things you're looking for, though, really high-quality stuff um, because that's going to have your higher amounts of things that actually work in the body to rebuild itself. Okay. So, all right. So that from the biochem perspective, now how does that work harmoniously with our daily lives. So I wake up. Uh, what do I want to eat? 
I, I go to lunch or, or I have my snack. What do I want to eat? I, I go to lunch. What do I want to eat? Because in, in remembering Al's conversation, he talked about balance and variety. So what is it, you know, being an athlete? And, Kev, you can chime in. We're, we're pretty regimented. And if you remember, Kevin, when you were an athlete, you know, what was that process for? What was nutrition for you? And what would it be now based on what Kevin's thoughts were? <laughs> okay. So, oh, I'll, wait, I'll let you I'll speak first, Johnny. Oh, uh, I, uh, okay. So let me reiterate the question basically <laughs> is. <laughs> In other words, what is it, for instance, I'm starting training. So I know I'm going to have a lot of heavy volume. It'll be quantity versus quality. You know, I've got Kevin Young. I'm training him. He's setting, He's getting ready to send a world record. What is the recommendation? What would you tell Kevin, Kevin, in order for you to get through this training process where we have a lot of high volume, what are we going to do? So the, what are we going to prescribe to him? Okay, so the main focus needs to shift to health because health is the foundation, period. You can't build performance without it. Right. So and that being said, these high-quality foods is something you want to go after. Stick to the perimeter, just like Al said. Um, one of the techniques and the, the reason why you want to do this is I have my guys take a cooler so that way they have all their food and I have them buy it fresh every day. They go around the perimeter, they, they fixate on and get the foods that are fresh. And I have them snack all day long nonstop. And the reason why that is is it controls um, insulin, protein synthesis, all that kind of stuff. You don't really ever get a high spike. The types of foods that you're picking, if they are throughout the day in a non-training state, meaning this is going into training or out of the recovery window afterwards, you want to maintain good, stable, low insulin levels and things that are going to break down throughout the entire day for the body. When you get into a before, there are certain foods that you can use, you know, about three hours before. You want to at least have three hours to digest your normal food before you even start a really good quality training session. You're fueling during. The conference has been locked. Getting in a really high quality. The conference has been unlocked. And a really, really good quality. What I, most of my guys, I'll have them do the recovery drink while they're eating their recovery meal. And you want to eat your recovery meal as soon as it's tolerable to your stomach as fast as possible. The body is completely wide open for about two hours. But that it takes a few hours to also digest these foods. So eating, if you wait to the final minutes within the two hours, you're not going to achieve a lot because it takes time for those things to break down and metabolize into the body. The earlier in the process you can do, eat those foods, the better you're going to be. So, Kevin, going back to... That yeah, Exactly. It does make a ton of sense. So, Kevin, when you, you were getting ready to set the world record, do you remember what you ate before you ran? Mm, well, even though it's funny, my metabolism was so high because, you know, being an athlete at that age, just, you know, being constantly just, you know, running and engaging... But I, I, I had a my regimen was pretty pretty simple. I, I tried to eat. Um, let me see. I remember being in the Olympic Village, sitting around with Quincy, and I had uh, some fruit, not much, probably like some pineapple. Um, but I, I, you know, ate some protein. I would say I probably had some some bacon or something, some sausage. It probably wasn't the best thing to eat. But like I said. <laughs> I was going to I was going to eat eat some protein and um, oatmeal of course as always a specialty of mine drink and I drank lots of water and uh, probably some toast I mean, let me let me look at it I look at it this way you know during the course of the day because I guess that's how I, I would envision envision my my meal my meals for the day would be um, a light breakfast um, leading up right before a workout. And then um, a, uh, not even, a, a, I wouldn't even say a, a lunch, more of a, a heavy snack, you would say, of some things that I can digest fairly quick uh, to keep me going, uh, and which would probably consist of, uh, you know, 
a nice hearty salad uh, uh, with maybe some light chicken on it, uh, a little bit of oil, some vinegar, uh, and just drinking lots and lots of water. I think for the most part, be honest with you guys, I drank so much water that that really curtailed my appetite. At, I guess uh, a number of the times in which I was, when when I was training, because I, you know I, I felt that I was full after the, the, the light meal which I had, um, and just staying hydrated and looking forward to a workout. Because typically, I'm not sure if, if, if uh, true enough, but I know a lot of times after major workouts in which I would have, it served as an anti-suppressant uh, for my um, appetite suppressant for myself. I really wasn't. I wasn't really hungry, I guess, right after the workout, but I would say literally about maybe an hour after I trained, I was ravenous, <laughs> you know. So that I guess that window depends on who, who what particular uh, metabolism you may happen to have. Um, but I, typically after workout, all I wanted to do was hydrate myself, you know. Gotcha. Well, we're going to cut to a commercial break, so we'll be back in about 22 seconds. So start your clocks. Bags by Cocho is proud to announce that we now carry a full line of track and field equipment. We are working in conjunction with MF Athletics. Go to our website and view our new Puma catalog at www.cocho.com. 22 seconds goes by fast. It's almost like that uh, recovery time when those athletes try to take uh, 60 seconds. But we're going to stay on task here and with uh, the great Kevin Young and Al Claiborne and Johnny Gamble. So, all right, so we know that nutrition is part of it, and Johnny, you said that you you keep your athletes eating. So, obviously, you're, you're affecting the metabolism. Now, one question I have for you is, how long does it take to, to make an effective change on the athlete's metabolism? So how many days consecutively do they have to eat like that? Okay, so when they start eating like that, and I have to credit this to a coach that really taught me the ins and outs of this when I first started getting at the professional level. He taught a method that he called the drip, and it was basically the dripping of nutrients throughout the entire day. Um, the reason why I came up with the concept is because it revs up your metabolism tremendously, and you'll feel a metabolic shift between 10 days and 14 days. You'll literally feel it. Um, then the next one comes after about 30 days after that. So, and you'll keep increasing. Um, your body will get leaner, and your recovery times will go up. And a lot of that is because you're controlling your metabolism, you're cr controlling the body's rate of consuming these meals so it's being fed throughout the entire day in small quantities and really good quality foods. The absorption goes up, and... You can also control acidity by eating a lot of greens. Um, cucumbers are great for that. Incorporating foods like beets. Um, beets are awesome at really increasing the blood levels, detoxifying the blood, creating things that, um, you know, getting clean, stronger blood, which also increases hemoglobin affinity. So we have a certain amount of red blood cells floating around, there's a percentage of those that don't have active hemoglobin, so your active hemoglobin will go up because of that, which is also related to uh, athlete's anemia or sports anemia. So those kind of things can take care of themselves just by eating a good, healthy diet throughout the entire day, spacing out like that. So what if I don't like beets? <laughs> what is there? What else can I do to affect the hemoglobin, blood volume, and detoxifying the system because I know that if we're doing a lot of uh, lactate work that the body can get toxic and uh, succumb to injury. So outside beets because, you know, beets aren't that palatable. Is there somewhere that we can, you know, is there a supplement that we can use to also help the uh, alkaline or reduce the uh, acidity of the blood, blood uh, volume? There's tons of good meal replacements out there. I would tend to stick to the greener meal replacements throughout that day. Um, a lot of them will contain beet powder because it is that good. People put it into the meal replacement foods, the whole food type uh, meal replacements. I, 
I shy away from the the other types of meal replacements that are more protein-based. Um, you want some protein in there, but you also, the greens is the main thing that almost everybody is missing. Um, it's easy to go out and get, most people like protein, regardless of if it comes from a nut, seed, egg, steak, or fish. People like protein. It's easy to digest. It's very palatable and it's easy to get down. Greens is where most of the issues come into play. So I would do something that's more heavy on greens, and you can sip on a health shake throughout the day. Now, Al, he, he talks about greens. What specifically right. green, and what about raw versus cooked? Okay. Well, um, one thing that he mentioned when he talked about beets, beets are what they call one of those, they call a low-grade um, uh, cannabolic uh, veg- uh, vegetable or a, or a f- Food and there's several that you can you can get that are that are alkaline based and you know you're looking at string beans you're looking at green beans you're gonna you know cauliflower asparagus um, you can go on and on pumpkin red cabbage green cabbage endive uh, corn uh, any of your alkaline based you know vegetables are gonna be good. And then you have your, you know, you also have your low-grade fruit that can also be used, like your your cherries, your apples, your honeydew, your peaches, your apricots, you know, grapes, nectarines, tangerines. I mean, you got a lot of you got a lot of choices, and um, and it, it and I love I love what he said about you know the, the hemoglobin and you know just setting up the blood to be nice and clean. And um, those alkaline-based nutrients can balance out an acidic athlete because you you build up a lot of acid just you know from the metabolic breakdown of nutrients and a lot of carbon. So uh, those uh, the alkaline-based vegetables and fruit can really help out. And cooked versus raw. Okay. Well, some some vegetables are very high dense vegetables that are they don't they don't digest really well. So once they get down to the lower intestines, the microbacteria get a hold to it, and they're still they're breaking it down even further. But those microbacteria give off gases as well, so it can make you a little gassy if you don't if you don't uh, if it's if it's not. If it's not, some of the vegetables need to be cooked. I mean, they're better they're better cooked on your system, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of things you can eat that are uh, that are okay raw. Um, I I kind of stay away from the root based vegetables when it comes to eating them raw. I kind of like them a little bit steamed. Um, uh, spinach is great raw. Uh, a lot of your greens, your kale. Uh, I make a, kale, a great kale salad with peppers and, and uh, chives, and you know you can you can uh, have that with a with a, a small bit of protein to just kind of you know give it a little uh, you know give it some sustenance. But for the most part, I mean you can even add nuts and seeds to that little fiber to it if you want more fiber. But a lot of those. Those uh, green leafy vegetables are great raw. So the greener. So, uh, so you definitely spinach, is it kale, spinach and kale. So is it because of uh, in, intestinal uh, trauma? I get not intestinal trauma. I don't want to use that word, but is it because of the digestibility, if that is such a word, uh, because you don't want to have such an invasive process? Is that why we we have to determine if we we cook them versus eating them raw? Well, some foods are just really, I mean, gassy. Beans and lentils, I mean, they can be, they're great foods, power foods. But definitely better cooked well because, you know, even parade, you know, into a soup because they they digest better. Um, The the skin, skin on the beans are very high in fiber. Uh, some of the, even your fruit can be, you know, so dense in fiber 
that it doesn't quite break down all the way. And uh, it can make you a little gassy when it gets down to the lower intestines. So um, if if I was to suggest you know, something for my athlete who's getting ready to perform, you definitely want them to feel comfortable. And that's why, you know, when um, when Johnny was talking about um, the drip system, that totally makes sense. He's, you know, you can you balance blood sugar and everybody who who performs you know with a with a balanced blood sugar they just feel so much more uh vibrant the mind thinks more clear you don't get into that bunking phase before a performance and you don't run into a lot of fatigue related to you know inflammation that that, that you know a high insulin spike could give you right so, i kind of uh, i kind of felt that when i when i would perform at a high level I would. I'm just thinking now. I would typically have a real hearty breakfast, something mm-hmm. that'll carry me over through lunch. And lunch was pretty much like I said, like a, a real light protein salad sort of thing. Even like you said, energy, uh, some sort of energy drink or some sort of protein shake. Nothing really heavy though, sitting on my stomach, knowing that I'm about to go out there and run around on the track in the heat. Um, but uh, it was one of those situations where I wasn't. I wasn't hungry. Uh, mm-hmm. I was just more just wanted to stay hydrated at that point. Um, and like you said, they have um, some snack foods hanging around, basically some nuts, um, dry fruit. That's something you can just, you know, and not to think a lot of dry fruit that are real high in, 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 in sugars. Um, but, you know, especially the, the nuts, it was really, really, really hard for me to just, you know, pop those in there and munch on them. Uh, and then just kind of clear my head and go out there and just run. Um, it's, it's very important that to make sure your 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 intestinal system is intact prior to a race, because you know, of course, when you're thinking about running the adrenaline's and your your system going up and down, we know as athletes, former athletes, that it's the first thing is <laughs> running to the restroom, whether you come out of one end or the other. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's true. And that's very them, especially when you're about to get into a race. Now, <laughs> right. now you talked about glycogen, so we're we're breaking it down to the cellular level. So how is it that I can saturate the cells and affect the mitochondria? I read that earlier, so I wanted to make sure I sounded smart and asked that question. So, Johnny, from your perspective, <laughs> <laughs> so how is it that I can get down into the cellular nutrition and, and have okay, a positive well, effect? I want to I back it up to training first. Um, one of the biggest things in training that people overlook is we mitochondria is the only organelle in the muscle cells or any cells, period, within the body that can actually replicate itself. The importance of that is because they are the energy pack to all the cells. So they process and utilize oxygen when you're in an aerobic training state, meaning you're only burning oxygen, you're at a very, very low threshold per heart rate and an easy exertion, um, to regulating lactic acid, which then later turns into fuel in more endurance athletes, but it also um, creates Krebs cycle, so there's a spit off of acid off the glucose. So the second you go into an anaerobic state, you're going to start burning sugar. So the biggest thing you can affect for mitochondrial growth is your training. Um, an endurance athlete or someone training for mid-distance or beyond in USA track and field is going to want to focus a good portion of their off-season on aerobic training and building endurance all by itself. And the reason why is these mitochondria, it's like a big party, man, when they're having oxygen. They're just kind of bouncing around, having a good time. They're replicating, man, they're having a good time. The second they've got to start converting glucose and turning it into all kind of other things, they got to start working. And when you start working, you stop breathing. So you want the mitochondria, you want your muscle cells full and packed full as much as possible of mitochondria. So training in an aerobic state during the off-season to prepare for later on in the season, if you have four to five mitochondria floating around in your muscle cell and it comes time to end season and they're trying to do all this work of converting glucose to lactic acid, they also convert lactic acid to back into glucose. So they're working their butts off. Would you rather have four guys working for you or a couple hundred? 
Exactly. I'd and that's take really the what it's going to affect <laughs> mitochondrial growth and the benefits of it down the road. Now, now, let me ask you this. How does that affect development in young people then? Because it sounds like it's almost, as, as a kid grows, I mean, you think about babies. When they really hit the big, fast growth cycles, they do a lot of sleeping. And I don't want to, um, don't want to, you know, miss that opportunity to talk about the sleeping. So, Al, can you well, kind of talk tied, about that's that? That's not really tied into mitochondrial growth. I mean, it can be because growth hormone is present in a really high factor during sleep period. Um, but as far as mitochondrial growth, you know, you're training e- really easy not trying to overdo it, and that's the hardest discipline any athlete goes into is when they go into a training session, they think they have to train hard every single session, and I see that more common than anything, than training once or twice a week really hard, the rest of the week really easy, allowing the body to recover from that. Um, Especially in the off-season, you want want to get as much energy storage as possible during the off-season, so you want to train at low intensity, but then... To complement it with diet, those dark leafy greens, and we're going to come back to dark leafy greens all the time because they're the most vital in mitochondrial growth as well. So they serve so many purposes. There's so many vitamins, um, Bs and minerals and different things that metabolically break down. It's like a cascade effect. They turn into so many millions of different other things in the body that help um, everything be in a more a health state so you can recover faster when things really hit it in the body when you're doing your hard training. So you put the money in the bank in the fall and then come back and utilize it during the competition season. Is that Mm -hmm. what I'm hearing from you? Basically, yeah. I mean, if you do smart training in the off-season and train easy and you work on your weaknesses and different things like that, you're going to get a lot more of a performance benefit three, four, or five months down the road than you would if you were always trying to stay in shape. You know, people try to keep a certain level of fitness because of fear of losing fitness. Well, you need to step back a couple bit, a little bit, and lose some fitness to gain. It's like stepping back two or three, but then leaping forward ten. I love come it. Come the next season. And that's the whole thing is creating a growth atmosphere when you're in training, so you're constantly in a growth rate. Sleep and... Um, training are two things we highly have control over and on top of diet. So if you can time all those things, the body is really rampant in growth hormone. So after training and or in right immediately after sleep. So a lot of my athletes, I like them to train twice a day if they can so they get a double hit of growth hormone there. And then you can get another growth hormone if you take a nap. And then if you go to bed at night, so if you're timing these things with the right foods that can tie in with the growth hormone to create IGF-1s, 2s, all those kind of things that increase protein synthesis, and you're going to increase your metabolism at the same rate. So that's why if you can create a basic anabolic state 24-7 to where your body is constantly in a growth state, after, especially during the breakdown, because training, you're destroying your body. I mean, that's why we're completely exhausted after training. So, so and, and not to cut you off, but Kevin, when you were, like I said, let, let's look, let's go back to Athens. Let's go back to the time that you, you set that world record. And I know you don't remember what you ate before, but do you remember having this level of understanding of nutrition going in or did you just eat healthy? I had a go-to meal. My go-to meal was probably was was with chicken and potatoes. Uh, you know, that was something that I was very comfortable with, and I, I knew my portions with that. And eating as much salad as I possibly could. I, you know, the you know the spinaches and all the all the leafy green stuff. That was always a go-to at, at any time of the night if I had an opportunity to eat, eat some sort of salad. But it got to a point in which. Um, it was I was pretty was, I was pretty basic in that you know I mean if I had an opportunity to binge on some burgers whatever I could do that because my metabolism was so high uh, 
I would I would just you know I would burn all that off you know and and I and, and most I think one of the most key things was was the fact that I got up and I moved around a lot I stretched a lot and I and I got my rest I mean you know when you when you when you when you train at a very a very high level and you, two things I think you have to you have to hydrate yourself you got to you got to lay yourself horizontally you, you know I think that is so important to um, to do just that um, and. I think I think and I would say I would eat um, you know eat eat some sort of amount of protein you know every week um, animal protein that is I'm telling you yeah I wasn't really big on supplement on eating um, supplementation didn't know much about it other than you know say, taking things like you know vitamin E and C and A and D and N and, um, and manganese and that sort of stuff but that was pretty much it I mean not at the level which I guess athletes are you know take a soldiers nowadays uh, but my diet was it was just eating eating healthy and getting enough sleep I think that was the key in my case eating healthy and getting enough sleep okay well we're going to cut to uh, another commercial and we'll be right back stay tuned Bags by Coach O is proud to announce that we now carry a full line of track and field equipment. We are working in conjunction with MF Athletics. Go to our website and view our new pool catalog at www.coachio.com. We're back. We're back. Man, I am uh, w- uh, thirsting for knowledge here today. Gentlemen, we are point on uh, with the information that's being passed out. And we've, in our last four, mig- four minutes of this segment, um, you know, one of the things is supplementation and Johnny, we talked about this supplementation is one thing, but why, in your opinion, are, are athletes getting busted? Well, they're not being careful what they take and they're getting bad advice. Um, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of factors, marketing, uh, misleads, uh, education out there, um, there's a lot of supplements that are not being made the right way. And what it really comes down to for the athlete, they're ultimately responsible for eating the food and supplements. So to take that out of the equation so you can take some safe supplements is making sure that they were tested for cross-contamination through organizations like BSCG, Band Substance Control Group, NFS, um, HFL, different organizations like that will test supplements and tell you if they're cross-contaminated. So for people at that level that are getting tested with their urine and blood, and they should really, really be careful of who they're taking advice from, make sure their supplements are covered and guaranteed that they're not cross-contaminated with anything on the water list whatsoever. And that's a really difficult thing um, because you can't just run into the local vitamin store and grab whatever you think is best because if it's not tested your career may be over and, right. and, and a lot of stuff that, that folks end up taking is in Greek <laughs> you know right. and it's very hard to understand exactly you need to talk to somebody who can really tell you exactly what's in those ingredients of those supplements you know they give you they try to provide a particular generic name for, for things and which stuff is actually Exactly, exactly. It's grouped together in categories, and um, when it comes to to the uh, to WADA and other organizations testing you, so it may. I mean, be- my advice is to usually stay away from herbs unless someone knows herbs like the back of their hand and they understand every um, everything that are in those herbs because herbs are the biggest culprit. And I think that um, you know, I guess we're doing a couple parts on this. This will be part one, part two. You know, we could talk about proteins and amino acids real specifically because there's all different types of proteins in supplement uh, in dietary supplement world. The quality of protein, what kind of protein you're taking can highly affect how fast you're going to recover right. on top of trigger amino acids. The third part will go into very specific herbs um, and, you know, just in case the uh, Tyson Gay, in his case, you know, it's rumored that he took an herb that contained the contaminant that caused, it was an amphetamine that caused a, a positive reaction. So he got some bad advice. So making sure these things, you don't want to be in that kind of case. You definitely want to safeguard yourself. Um, 
And that's, I mean, that's all you can do is to test, make sure that stuff you're taking is tested. And a lot of your thermogenics carry a lot of that stuff in it too. And you don't really know that. You're thinking, okay, well, I need something, you know, to just bring me up so I can get through this session, this training session, give me some energy. And then it has, you know, it has, uh, it has products like that that could, that can, uh, that can throw a test. Now, Kevin, and Kevin, you asked earlier about um, these energy drinks, and um, what is it? For instance, I, I go to a track meet, and Kevin, you you've watched, and I looked at the garbage can, and I see a ton of the Red Bulls and all these other energy drinks, Monster, and God knows what. Why are these athletes taking these if we know that they're 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 just packed with sugar. So that bunk, as you said earlier, Al, um, why are they going that direction? Marketing, marketing, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with a high-level athlete, $40 million athlete by Red Bull. Had to make him some very custom supplementation. And he had to have that Red Bull in his hand nonstop at all the events. In that Red Bull container, he had water. So all he was drinking was water all day. But these kids see that, and they go out and they buy the the energy drinks. They think that's what's going to give them performance, when in actuality they're very dangerous. Um, there's an amino acid known as taurine that's really popular in all of them. Yep. Amino acids, one of its jobs in the body is to flush or pull um, a high level of potassium into the heart. So that causes a huge positive charge going into the heart, which gives you that energy boost and effect, but can also be very dangerous if you're trying to go into an intense workout or competition. Wow. And so they're actually literally pulling potassium out of the system, put injecting in their, or, or putting in the heart. It's raising the heart levels. Is this where sometimes the, uh, the well, not necessarily the athlete, but is this where sometimes you see people get in trouble by taking those sugary energy drinks? Because they're, they're the ones that are ended up in ER because of heart, um, right. Heart problems, that's where the majority of it's coming from, plus the added caffeine effect. I mean, those things are really high in caffeine, which, by the way, you know, in any USA track and field athlete, you are subject to WADA, which caffeine is a very regulated substance. So you've got to be really careful with those kind of products. Um, John, i got a quick question. What, what did you say when, and I'm going to give me the example. I remember when I was competing, um, I, had mentioned this question a few times. When I was competing, um, pseudoephedrine was was illegal. Okay, ephedrine was illegal, and so you couldn't take anything with with ephedrine, pseudoephedrine. Then, years later, it was it was on the ban list. It was off the ban list. It was on the ban list. It was back off the ban list. At certain levels, you know, water could I guess figure out whether they want to keep it there, or take it or take it off the list. Um, why it's not necessarily if they want to decide if they want to keep it there. It's kind of like a pseudo-regulated um, supplement. So sometimes right. you'll see it off, sometimes you'll see it on. Um, it'll go exactly. on and off forever. Exactly. But WADA, you know, that's a proper question for someone on WADA. They can answer it in more technical detail. Mm -hmm. um, but that is something that's regulated. I would just stay away from any of those products, period, unless you have a basically a permission slip from your right, doctor right. and is approved by USADA. Mm -hmm. The T-U-E that they call it. Um, yeah, the T-U-E. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I, mean, I, mean, I tell you what, um, 45 minutes come faster than we ever thought, and I <laughs> want to thank everybody for the time. Hey, uh, next Friday, I want to get into amino acids, and other other types of uh, nutrition. I think that'll be a great part two. I, I want to make this a part four series because I think we talked about the general piece and understanding nutrition, but we now got to get into the nuts and bolts. And right now we've got a lot of track and field championships. Uh, 
going on. We People are getting excited about world champions, and I look forward to having all you, three of you gentlemen on uh, Inside the Oval. So next week, next Friday, look forward to hearing from everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>